Good evening. Good evening. I would like to call this meeting of the West Dallas West Milwaukee uh, et al. School District to order. Would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <coughs> Suzette, would you please call the roll? Ms. Emmons? Yes. Ms. Curran is excused. Mr. Lee? Here. Mr. Ustra? Here. Mrs. Justin? Here. Mrs. Sujecki? Here. Mr. Bailey? Present. Mr. Keller? Here. President Sickich? Present. Proper notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the open meeting laws of the state of Wisconsin. Board members and Dr. Lexmans, any modifications or adjustments to tonight's agenda? Uh, I have nothing. Looks like nothing from the board. We'll move on. No public comments. Wait a minute. No so public comments? I saw Brian run into him. I wasn't sure if he was looking for public comments. Brian, any comments? None? Thank you. We'll move on to number seven, superintendent's report. Huh, that was fast. All right, um, we'll go to 7.1. Um, this evening we have our report from West Dallas Nathan Hale High School. Our student representatives are here, so if you could introduce yourselves to the board and the public again and tell us what's going on at Nathan Hale. Hi, I'm Nathan Rao. I'm uh, Nathan Hale's senior representative. And uh, yeah, I'm the football captain and track captain, and uh, I am on NHS, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, I'm Anna Coleman. I'm a junior. I'm captain of the POM team and the vice president of, of the Junior Student Council. Great. I'd just like to thank you for letting us share a couple things about here with you. And we'll start with our uh, Stoneman Douglas High School support letters. Uh, first and foremost, our thoughts and prayers are with the family, st friends, student body, and entire staff of our extended student family at Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, as they return to school this week and begin the long journey and healing process ahead of them. To show our support, Nathan Hale thought it'd be an awesome act of kindness and compassion to write letters to the Stoneman Douglas students showing our support in their healing process. So today we challenge all homerooms and class councils to join in this letter writing effort, doing our part as fellow students to let them know we are thinking of them during this difficult time. The letters can either be written by homerooms with a bunch of signatures giving us about 100 letters to send, or it would be awesome to send 1,500 individual ones, flooding them with support from Husky Nation. The letters will be collected and sent out by the end of this week. We'll continue with Hale Music Concert. Uh, last Thursday, we held our music department's Masterworks Concert. <coughs> it was a great night showcasing our most experienced choir, band, and orchestra students in collaboration with college faculty, college students, and West Dallas, West Milwaukee music faculty to perform John Rutter's Requiem and the world premiere of Errante's Lyric Violin Concierto. The soloists for these pieces were a college professor and a graduate student in music performance, allowing our students to interact with professionals in the field of classical music. Uh, the Rudder Requiem is a significant work in the choral repertoire and is often performed by professional ensembles. Most high schools are not able to put on concerts of this size and difficulty, and these kinds of musical events show growth from elementary through the end of high school. This was collaboration taken to the next level. The statewide ACT is being given to all juniors at Nathan Hale and high schools all over the state this week, tomorrow, and Wednesday. All juniors will be taking the ACT and ACT work keys test as a measure of individual student college and career readiness, as well as the Department of Ed Public Instruction Accountability measure impacting our state school rating. In preparation, all juniors participated in a practice ACT test earlier this year and have now been reviewing the key concepts of English, math, reading, and science in their core classes preparing for these test days. In addition, problems similar to those found on the Work Keys Workforce application test are being reviewed in all elective courses as well. We wish our juniors the best of luck on this. <coughs> we'll continue with academic and athletics update. It's been an awesome winter season at Nathan Hale in both academics and athletics, and we have much to be proud of here at Husky Nation. First and foremost, looking at our students' academic achievement, they have demonstrated excellence in the classroom with 698 of our students achieving honor roll status for first semester. <laughs> this is not only a reflection of our students' efforts, but also of our dedicated and talented staff at Hale. These students will be recognized at our annual academic banquet in May. 
May 22nd for junior and senior, and the 23rd for freshmen and sophomores. And then on to athletic news with wrestling. Congratulations to our Husky wrestling team and head coach Randy Farrell on their achievement this past season, finishing as GMC Conference dual meet co-champions with nine wrestlers qualifying for the sectional meet earlier in February and three wrestlers, Brandon Baltz, Marshall Rushton, and Peyton Mako, competing at the WIAA state tournament in Madison this past weekend. We are proud to announce that Peyton won the state title at the 160-pound weight class by a dominating score of 11-2 to two, and is now a two-time state champion. We congratulate Peyton on a great high school career at Hale and wish him the best of luck as he continues his education in wrestling at the University of Missouri on a scholarship next year. Uh, we'll continue with the <coughs> update with girls basketball. Uh, congratulations to the Hale girls basketball team as they were crowned GMC conference co-champions for the 2017-18 season, finishing with a 13-3 conference record and 21-3 overall. They are now competing in the WIAA tournament winning their regional this past Saturday in overtime versus Brookfield Central by the score of 63-61. to 61. The girls came back from being down seven points with two minutes left to take the lead in the last seconds of regulation time before pulling off the victory in OT. The girls now move on to sectionals this Thursday at Waukesha South versus Oak Creek at 7 p.m. Get it on your calendar and come out and support the ladies to victory. And now for the dance team. The Nathan Hale dance team competed in their last competition of the season yesterday. They competed at the Badgerette Spirit Championships at Brookfield East High School against high school teams from Wisconsin and Illinois. They took fifth place in jazz and <coughs> hip hop, fourth place in their kick routine, and second place in Tom. The team also entered a dancer from each grade level to get noticed as an outstanding performer. They are evaluated on showmanship, technique, physical ability, and execution in their palm routine. Emma Strinkowski placed fourth in the senior division, Jaden McCann placed third in the sophomore division, and Abby Lytell placed first in the freshman division. We congratulate the ladies on an incredible season. And we'll wrap up with our Athletic Hall of Fame. Nathan Hale had our first induction into the Athletic Hall of Fame last Thursday, sponsored by the Athletic Booster Club. It was an overall talented and well-deserving group of nominees for consideration, with five candidates clearly rising to the top. We congratulate Mary Blandino, Rick Belford, Lisa Oldenburg, uh, Gary Polzinski, and Lori Somer on being the first class of inductees into the Nathan Hale Athletic Hall of Fame. Having the qualities of outstanding student athletes and coaches with, resume, with resumes of state appearances, state titles, school, state, and personal records, multi-sport athletes, along with competition and success at the college and professional level, and giving back to the Hale and West Dallas community. That's it. Thank you. Yep, thanks, right. Leonard. Questions or comments? Sue? <coughs> I was at the basketball game, right. and I don't think that I've ever seen a more exciting basketball game <laughs> in my life. It was pretty exciting, yeah. It was <laughs> unbelievable. And for people who uh, still have the newspaper, the Milwaukee Journal on February 20th had a very good article about Hales Girls basketball on memorable, a memorable ride. Uh, it's, it's just a very good article and it talks about sports. <laughs> and you guys. <laughs> so it was, it was wonderful. And I did go to your uh, Hall of Fame dinner, which was so nicely done. Thank you. It, uh, you know, whoever put, well, I'm not sure who put it together, but it, it was really nice and I, I hope that they recorded the program, the concert afterwards, because I would have really loved to see it, but I, I didn't. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? <coughs> I, just, <coughs> I just want to gr congratulate Peyton Mockle. There's not many finer young men than that kid right there. Uh, sure. And then the ladies, the lady Huskies at basketball game, I'm gonna echo what you said, that was amazing. Mm -hmm. And congratulations to Coach Satiros and, and the girls, and some really, really great role models for these for these girls growing up. Just fantastic. Thank you. Really cool. Anyone else? Okay, once again, we thank you, and thank you for your report, but you do not need to stick around to listen to the rest of our business unless you're really we interested in it. <laughs> <laughs> we won't take offense if you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Great, so we'll move on to 7.2, the legislative update. I will just briefly touch on some of the uh, highlights of the document the board has. 
So the, uh, the board's aware there's a Blue Ribbon Commission on School Funding um, that's continuing to have uh, public hearings to get input uh, before they start making recommendations. So the latest one is going to be at the Northwoods International School in La Crosse on Monday, March 26th. Um, Senate Bill 711, we've touched on this uh, before. This has been approved. This is an opportunity that creates a grant program to assist high school teachers by covering tuition expenses for courses taken to meet the qualification requirements of the Higher Learning Commission for el eligibility to teach dual enrollment courses. And this is um, encouraging for us because it's something we're tr working to expand. We had a, actually had a meeting last week. It was our kind of mid-year update with MATC. Um, on the courses that we're working to add to dual enrollment uh, opportunities. And so dual enrollment means that a, a student can be in a high school course and that high school teacher is qualified to teach it at a college level. And so that uh, the, the, if a young person is successful in that course, they can get both high school credit and college credit. Right? Um, and we may in fact, as we push forward in redefining READY, add a requirement that before you get a high school diploma from West Dallas, West Milwaukee, you have to have either an AP course that makes you eligible for college credit or an actual college credit, right? And lots of districts are moving in that direction so that we kind of, you get early college kind of as part of your high school graduation. And so, you know, we're, we're encouraged by this because it helps pay for the training teachers need, but we're uh, working hard to expand the number of dual um, college credit or dual enrollment courses that we offer. On um, Assembly Bill 693, this one is still moving forward. This is, has been um, referred to as the Teacher Protection Act, and we've reported earlier that you know, there was traction in the Assembly, not in the Senate, and so we figured it would probably um, not <coughs> move forward, but given the recent um, situation in Florida, this seems to have more conversation, although there's kind of a watered-down version of it at this point. We're continuing to watch, watch this SAA and WASB have pretty significant concerns about this just because of the amount of, I think, potential confusion it can cause. Um, but, but again, I think any conversation about how we keep schools safe is probably healthy, even though there's things in here we're concerned about. Um, Assembly Bill 805, this was that um, <laughs> concurrent enrollment fix. And this one has moved forward. This has to do with which early college credit program courses would and would not um, be accepted. And so there was some technical language that needed to be cleaned up in that. So that one has moved forward. Um, and there's nothing new at the federal level at this <coughs> point. Um, I'll move on to 7.3, congratulatory resolutions. Question. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I had a question about the uh, Senate Bill 711. So with the increase, the uh, possible increase of more dual credit enrollment, does that uh, have a, a budgetary concern for us considering that aren't we normally paying for the tuition on the other side of it for the students that participate in that? Um, no. Um, so I think when, when the students, if they enroll in MATC, then, then they would pay for it. Okay. Um, is, is how it generally works. So, so we don't care. We have a, a, a number of transcripted courses now, mm -hmm. um, and we don't uh, budget additionally for the um, credits kids are getting that are college um, available credits. Okay. Yep. Thank you. But a good, good question. Uh, moving on to congratulatory resolutions. First, um, uh, on behalf of the West Dallas West Milwaukee School District, I want to thank three area businesses, West Stallion, the Drunk Uncle, and Alfonso's The Original for their, do their donation of $750 to the art and music programs at Central High School and Nathan Hale High School. You may have followed this in um, Jim Stingle's article that um, we kind of tripped up on ourselves a little bit trying to receive the $750. Um, <coughs> but, but it's also uh, the whole piece around fundraising and donations is something we're trying to put a little better fiscal management around and we got ourselves a little bit tripped up on this one and it's a little bit embarrassing but at the same time, uh, these are the right controls to put in place. But we're very grateful to anybody in the community that wants to raise money to help our programs, to help kids. So we're really appreciative of these business owners. They're all alums, which makes um, the confusion even more embarrassing. But, um, but, but I think we're, you know, we've moved through that part now, and their generous contribution is gonna be used to support the important work in the area of art and music at the high schools, and truly appreciate them for that. Then a couple of the student recognitions. Um, so Peyton Mako that we've already heard about, he was the individual WIA state wrestling title, won that at 160 pounds. He finished the season with a 58 
and one record. Peyton is the only wrestler from either Central or Nathan Hill High School to ever win more than one individual state wrestling title. Academically, which is, I think, what makes him really interesting is he is among the top students in this year's senior class. He may, in fact, be the valedictorian at the end. Peyton will be wrestling at the University of Missouri beginning next fall, and congratulations to him on an outstanding career, and good luck at Missouri. Um, Caleb Emerit McCowan. Caleb finished in sixth place for the West Alice Wave Combined Swimming and Diving Team in the one-meter dive at the WIAA State Swimming and Diving Competition in Madison. That was February 16th and 17th. Then the following wrestlers qualified for the WIAA State Tournament this past weekend at the Kohl Center in Madison. Quentin Brown, Central High School at 106 pounds. Brandon Baltz, Nathan High School at 132. Marshall Rustin, Nathan High School at 138 pounds. And Peyton Mako at um, Hale at 160 pounds. And then again, congratulations to the Nathan Hale <coughs> girls basketball team. They were the champions of the Greater Metro Conference this season and also won the regional title over the weekend. So they will play Oak Creek at 7 o'clock this Thursday at Waukesha South High School. So we wish them all the luck. And then uh, the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction is officially declaring next week, uh, <coughs> March 5th to the 9th, as National School Breakfast Week. Uh, the proclamation recognizes the significant contributions of school nutrition staff and the importance of a nutritious, well-balanced school breakfast to the health, well-being, and the education of children. I think the board is aware that we've expanded universal free breakfast in a number of schools through the community eligibility program. And <clears throat> it, it seems to be making a difference with getting kids to school, uh, making sure kids are, are fed, especially right away in the morning so they're uh, ready and available for learning. So we very much appreciate all the work our food service employees um, do on behalf of the kids. And then um, last one, a very special congratulatory resolution. Where's Nick Burr? Oh, there you are. <laughs> okay, come on up, Nick. Um, so we, Nick is going to present this um, on behalf of the board, but really uh, it's a certificate of appreciation around the work that's being done in one of our local um, churches around the Hope Closet. And it's been a huge benefit for our kids and families, and we just really want to take a moment to um, recognize all of that effort. So, Nick, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Before, we'll do a short recognition after the director of the Hope Closet uh, speaks, but... Um, I just want to say, as, as my role as Director of Students and Transition, uh, Students and Families in Transition, it's just been such a pleasure this year to work with the, the volunteers of the Hope Closet. Um, and in all things in education, we're as successful as our partners are in the community. And we can't be all things to all people, but we need to um, have partnerships and have community help us. And uh, might I add that they sure have made it easy. Um, because they are there for our families. And uh, Donna Jonasson in just a moment is going to speak on behalf of all the volunteers of the Hope Closet to talk about what they do. Um, but I will tell you this, they do it with joy. And they, they provide so many things for our families who are in transition. And Donna will speak to that. But as she speaks, I want you to know that all the volunteers do it with joy. They treat our families with such dignity. And I hear so often from the parents and from the students how much they appreciate it. And uh, I don't think even the volunteers probably know all the impact that they are doing. And again, they do it with joy, they do it with dignity, and our district is so appreciative. So um, Donna, if you would come up, and she's going to speak for a few minutes in terms of what they do, and then I will present her with her certificate afterwards. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. Hi. I'm Donna Jonasson. I'm here to give you an update about the Hope Closet. You may or may not have heard of it before. Um, and I'm here with uh, Pastor Brian Halverson from our church and then members of our kind of core committee, the people that um, helped this initiative get going. Uh, I would venture to say that there's probably not a partnership like this in the entire state of Wisconsin. This is a partnership between the West Dallas West Milwaukee School District and our church. And as you'll hear, we're getting some other agencies involved as well. In September 2016, we opened the Hope Closet as a ministry for people in our community who are homeless who are in transition, who have not a permanent address. Uh, we give out new clothing to these uh, clients and their families. We serve the entire family, infants through adults. So anybody who's living in the household, grandparents, aunts and uncles, adult children, whoever is living in the home, uh, can come and receive free clothing from us. We've decided to provide new clothing. Uh, the main reason is because it gives people such dignity to be able to come and choose something brand new to wear. A lot of times when people are in this situation, they have to go to smelly warehouses and 
be handed things that they may or not, may not be able to use. Um, and we like that it's a choice model that they can come and choose. Um, we, are, we started with our clothing and we have a referral process through the school district. So the social workers have a form that they fill out. They email it to me with the information about the family. Uh, they also give the family a sheet of paper that tells them what the Hope Closet does and explains how to get a hold of us, what our hours are, and so forth. Um, and if I don't hear from the family after a couple weeks, I will give them a call and we'll arrange a time for them to come in. They're often kind of shy when they first come in, but as soon as they come, they know then that they can come back. We operate on a point system. Uh, so each person in the family is given 30 points for clothing. And all of our clothing is tagged. So our volunteers tag everything with a colored tag that tells how many points that item is worth. So like a t-shirt would be two points, a hoodie would be four points, and so forth. Um, that way they can spend their points on what they actually need. We always give socks and underwear for free, usually three pairs of socks, three pairs of underwear when they come each time. Uh, this year we also gave out winter clothing with no cost in points. We gave out over 200 winter coats, brand new to our clients. Uh, hats, mittens, scarves, gloves, and some snow boots and snow pants as well. Um, they get their 30 points about three times a year. Uh, and so they can come in and use their points if they don't find the correct size. I have to tell you, we've expanded greatly. When we started in September 2016, we started in a small office that was our Sunday school office. Now we've expanded to an assembly room that used to be the choir room. It's quite large. We have another small room that we just um, created a baby room where we have diapers and baby clothing and baby blankets, baby lotion, shampoo, things like that. Uh, and we have another room yet where we store school supplies. In uh, August of last year, we did a back to school event and we gave out 95 backpacks filled with school supplies. We got the school supply list from the school district so the families could come in and get everything that they needed to start the first day of school, including a brand new backpack. And boy, the smiles on those kids' faces that they could walk in with what they need. Can you imagine how embarrassing it is when everybody's coming in with their new things and you don't have them? Um, the families that we serve, right now we have about 75 mm -hmm. families on our case list, which includes about 300 people. Uh, we find that there's about 200 or more kids in transition in West Dallas School District every year. Uh, we have a few more than that because we don't just let people go just because they find an apartment. We try to give them support for some time after that because people of this income level, the statistics show that they spend about 80% of their income on rent. That doesn't include utilities. That doesn't include clothing and food and other things. So they really need that support when they're trying to get back on their feet. Uh, we're funded by many sources. Our congregation has been generous enough to fund part of this. But we also get support from private donations. Uh, we get some support from community um, organizations, like we've gotten money from the Shriners, from the uh, Lions Club, things like that. But we're, and, and grants, small grants from Thriven, from Northwestern Mutual, they'll give grants. If their employees volunteer, then they'll give you a small grant. So we're funding from a variety of sources. I want to mention we're having a big fundraiser, April 21st, <laughs> at Mount Hope. Um, we're going to have uh, fashion and craft vendors, probably about 25 vendors at the church. It's a $5 admission fee, and then you can come in, walk around, and shop. And it's also a great chance to see the Hope Closet and see what it looks like. Uh, we love that it's clean. We love that people get a good feeling when they walk in. There's carpeting on the floor. Their walls are painted nicely. The clothing's hung in a really organized way. Uh, in May of this past year, we decided that we were ready to open a food pantry for our clients. So we now have another room in the, in the lower part of the church that's a food pantry, which also operates on a point system. So we give out 40 points for a family of four. Um, if they have more people, they get another 10 points per person. So if you have a very large family, you can get extra points. Everything is priced at either one, two, or three points. Linda, um, one of our volunteers here, organized all of it. Um, and again, it's an awesome thing that it's choice. Oftentimes when people go to food pantries, they're handed a box and it's food that they may or may not use. You know, Just because they're poor doesn't mean that their kids like to eat everything, that they might not like that kind of cereal or they might not like to drink dry milk, You know, um, things like that. So they really love that they can come in and pick what they want. 
uh, the food pantry, they can come in for every single month. So we are starting to see our clients come in pretty much monthly if they have leftover clothing points and they can spend them at that time. We'll slip them extra things like laundry detergent, cleaning supplies, some of those kinds of things, uh, toiletries like toothbrushes and toothpaste and shampoo and body wash when we have them. And people are so appreciative. They're dealing with so many issues. Most of our clients are doubling up with other families. We find they move from place to place to place. They're often in not very good situations. Um, they're staying with people that might not be real stable people to stay with. They're just trying to get a roof over their heads. The majority are single moms. Probably half of them or more are escaping domestic violence and have left a situation where they've walked out with nothing but the clothes on their back. Um, some of our families do live in shelters. Some of them live in cars. Uh, when they don't have a car to get to the, ch to the hope closet, I go pick them up. So we're driving sometimes way to the north side, to the east side, south side, all over the city in quite a wide um, radius. But I, I commend you for having a program where children are able to stay in the same school because I'm a former educator and uh, it's so, so important for them to have that stability. Research shows that every time a child leaves uh, school and goes to a new school, they lose three months of education. So if a child goes to three or four different schools in a year, you might as well wash out the year. They get so, so, so behind. Plus the whole social thing of having to make new <coughs> friends all the time. Um, they deal with a lot of issues that we might deal with as people that have a decent income. Uh, one woman has a son with autism. She was in a shelter for a month, but she was asked to leave because he would have outbursts and they didn't understand how to deal with those outbursts. We have three or four clients that have cancer. Um, some that have lost their jobs because of cancer and now that, that's what's caused them to be homeless. So oftentimes they're taking in other children. We have one family that's taken in four children of relatives who were taken away by CPS. Uh, they didn't want the children to end up in the system so they brought them in along with their six children. Both mom and dad are working, it's an intact family, but they're really, really struggling to support all of these kids. Uh, there's a lot of mental illness. One woman whose husband is in a um, psychiatric hospital and will be for the rest of his life because he's so ill. His mom owned the house that they lived in and they were renting and when he ended up in the hospital, she blamed the wife and kicked out the, the mom and her three boys. Now the kids are showing some signs of mental illness. The oldest one is agoraphobic and won't leave the house. Um, she can't even get him to take out the garbage unless it's nighttime. Um, so she's dealing with that as well as trying to provide a home. Um, and then of course a lot of domestic violence. I wanna tell you just one quick story about one client because it'll give you an idea of the roadblocks that come up for these people. We have a client named Wanda. In December, she left a violent situation with her husband. She stayed with a family, or not a family member, a friend. Unfortunately, this friend is a woman who is a severe alcoholic. She has children, three children ages two, six, and eight. So what she would do is she would stay out late at night um, as long as she could because she didn't want to deal with this woman's outbursts. And they would sneak into the house real quietly, go upstairs, and she'd try to get the kids to bed without making any noise. You can, as a teacher, I'm thinking, when is that eight-year-old doing his homework? You know, where is he? He's driving around in a car until 10 o'clock at night. Uh, one night she was into the closet in January and as she was um, coming in, she was on the phone and this woman was having a tirade and she said to her, don't come back, I don't want you here. If you come here, I'll call the police. She had no recourse, she doesn't have a lease or anything like that. We paid for a hotel that night for her to stay in. Uh, she's been in and out of different places. Uh, she did spend three nights in the car with her three children. Um, in the you know cold of January. Uh, she now is in a shelter, fortunately. But the other part of the story is she tried to go back to retrieve her things from this woman's home because her clothes were there and whatever little they had. And the woman attacked her and hit her over the head with an iron. Um, so she came in with bruises on the side of her head. She filed a police report and I, I don't quite know where that's at. But now, um, as of about a week ago, they are finally in a safe shelter. Again, she wasn't able to find a shelter. The shelter is a huge overlying issue. We have no shelters for the homeless in West Dallas. There are a few in Milwaukee, a few in Waukesha, but the waiting lists are about 500. Mm. And so even if you're a mom with small children, there is no place to go. Um, so with that, I just want you to know that we're working to provide community partnerships. We see this as something that's only going to get bigger. 
Uh, we are talking it up. You can tell people about it um, because we're looking for all the support and all the effort that we can get together to continue to make this a success. And what we're most proud of is that we don't just give people things who are in these situations. I feel like we really do give them hope. When they come in, it's not uncommon for them to have tears uh, because they can't believe that they can come in and not have to have an ID and not have to prove where they live and they don't have an address anyway, so how are they going to prove that? Um, and that we will just give them new things that they can use. Uh, we get hugs, we get smiles, we get tears. I think people, when they come in, they feel welcome. They feel like they're treated with dignity and respect. They're not judged for who they are. And because of that, they often open up and tell their stories. And I think that gives them some relief, too. We can't fix it. There's, it's so overwhelming to figure out how to fix this situation of poverty in our country and in our community. But we can just do a little bit with, with every person, with each individual person, and try to make a difference. And so my daughter has a saying. She's, she, my kids all went through West Dallas schools. She, um, she's an advocate for many things. Uh, and she says, Mom, we can't change everything, but we have to change things one smile at a time. And mm -hmm. I think that that stays in my head. Uh, so that when people walk in our doors, I want to greet them with a <coughs> smile and I want them to walk away feeling like they're valued and that someone cares. So come anytime to see us. We're located at Mount Hope Lutheran Church on 86th and Beecher, right across from Franklin Elementary. We'd love to see you there. And on behalf <coughs> of the West Dallas West Milwaukee School District, we'd like to present to you the little bit certificate of appreciation for all that we do for our families. Before you all leave, I'm really happy to see, I'm really happy to see and glad to see Christianity working. Thank you. Thank Paula? you, everybody. Wait a minute, Paula, did you not want to say something? No, I don't You were not going to answer <laughs> <laughs> all that. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Um, so that was great. So we'll go on 7.4, just a few um, quick updates. So public comments from our meeting on February 12th. There were three people that spoke about the territory transfer. I'm not going to um, address those things specifically right now because we have that item on before the board this evening, item 10.1, but just so I acknowledge the public comments. Um, we are working on kind of the next iteration of you know, the workshop we did with the board on our strategic plan that we're calling Going Deeper. And so there's, um, you know, the feedback that we've been collecting so far. So there'll be a new iteration of that that will then start to kind of bring out further into um, listening sessions with teachers, with the community, some of those things so we get more input before we bring it back for another board conversation. Um, this past week I attended a conference in Atlanta and I'm um, tapping into conferences that are either fully paid or almost fully paid, um, because I think I think it's important that you know all of us um, and even superintendents commit to ongoing learning. Um, and in Stephen Covey's work, he calls it sharpening the saw. Um, so you've got to spend some time in that. It was a, I think a, a really good conference. Um, it was introduced to new filtering software, which goes a little bit above my head, frankly. Um, but some uh, powerful kind of tools um, that we're going to investigate that can live in the background to really monitor um, even more specifically what students are doing on our networks. And I think that's something that, you know, they're offering a, a 90 day free kind of look, look back. So it'll look like, okay, we'll filter 90 days of traffic for you for free and um, see what our filters <coughs> pick up compared to what theirs pick up. Um, yeah, and it was a little bit of like, I'm not sure I want to know. Um, <laughs> and then the, the main speaker at this conference was George Kuros. And George is the author of The Innovator's Mindset. And this is part of what's kind of sitting behind our whole going deeper. It's one of the frameworks. And George is actually going to be our keynote speaker when we start school again in August. Um, we've yeah. contracted to bring him here. 
um, as a way to kind of kick off this whole uh, effort into you know creating new learning opportunities for kids. So that was he's a phenomenal speaker and really inspiring and challenging. So yeah, so when, um, if you have the opportunity in August uh, to join us. Um, we already heard that this week is you know ACT testing for 11th graders, so this is a high stakes <coughs> week. Um, and you know we introduced method test prep, so kids get more specific practice and feedback around the ACT. So we're um, hoping for gains, uh, but it's always kind of a high stakes moment um, for 11th graders. <coughs> and then just a couple things on something everybody's paying attention to right now, which is school safety. Right. So what what are we doing? Are we doing anything differently as a result of? you know, the most recent school shooting um, in Florida. And, and just so the public hears it, who's ever listening, I mean, we have um, armed police officers in our secondary schools, right? So all of the intermediate schools and full-time in the high schools, full-time at FLW given its size, and then the others share a little bit. So um, we feel pretty good about that. So we're already um, in the space where a lot of people are saying, we, you know, we need to harden schools. Um, but the reality is there's absolutely no way to keep a school 100% safe unless you, you know, gate it in and have armed guards at every entrance and, um, and you have armed security patrolling hallways everywhere all the time and that's not a school anymore, right? That's called a prison. Um, and so these are really difficult um, problems to try to sort through. But we are reviewing our protocols and our procedures. Are there anything, adjustments that need to be changed? And one of the things that we discovered recently in a lockdown drill at Lane was there was a, a maintenance worker there, um, not a part of the building, so somebody that comes from the district staff and was kind of left out in the hallways in the middle of the lockdown. And we're like, oh, we don't even have that in our protocol. Um, of, you know, so what should be done when you have itinerant staff that are occasionally in buildings and how do they know what they're supposed to do? So that's an example of some of the things we're paying attention to to really tighten up. And then um, Steve Rohde's team uh, right now is we're going through, and he and I um, and Mike Weaver met this morning, where we're auditing all of the uh, cameras that potentially could um, either be adjusted or added to exterior um, surveillance. So we have a better picture of kind of who's outside at doors. Uh, and, and also auditing, I've mentioned before, the, all the doors that have swipe access and try to get a, a handle on all of those and uh, do we need enhancements, do we want to change camera angles, uh, do we need to spend some money on cameras. So we are uh, paying attention to what we can do um, that's reasonable and something we can probably work into the budget. Uh, but in the big picture, it really comes down to making sure all kids are connected and when they're not that kids and parents, you know, have, have um, the sense to tell people <coughs> is really what I think is the best um, way to keep schools safe. But I wanted to just touch on that so that, you know, the public hears that, um, like every school district, we're looking more closely at this now than ever. And that completes my <coughs> report. Thank you. Questions or comments for Dr. Lexman? None? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> we'll move on to the board, number eight, the board's president, uh, board president's report. I'll do the calendar first. After tonight's regular Board of Education meeting, we'll have a business services workshop dealing with the 216-217 audit report. On Monday, March 12th at 6 o'clock, we have a regular Board of Education meeting, followed by a business services workshop dealing with the enrollment and budget projections for 18-19. Monday, March 19th, we have a workshop dealing with the CESA services. And on Monday, March 26th, we have the regular Board of Education meeting. Just a reminder that our meetings are open to the public and televised, and they begin at 6 o'clock. And our meetings, uh, um, pardon me, our workshops are open to the public, but those are not televised. Would like to uh, put a little plug in. Uh, as board president, I'm an uh, ex officio member of the West Dallas Community Improvement Foundation. They are having their annual dinner dance fundraiser uh, at Zufari on March 24th. Uh, it's 6 o'clock. I believe Suzette has tickets if you are interested, unless our package of tickets are sold out already. I don't know. Well, we have them. <coughs> so if you're interested right. in that. And I would also like to uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Lexman. He and the superintendent from Menominee Falls and the uh, superintendent from Milwaukee were on John Mercure's show Friday afternoon about 3 o'clock dealing with school safety. And uh, specifically, it was the, the start of the program was uh, Attorney General Schrimmel talking about how he wanted to have, uh, arm teachers with weapons in the schools and all three commented on that and 
it was pretty obvious nobody from the education side thinks that that was a very good idea. Mm -hmm. But I want to thank you. I think you represented our district very well. Good. Thank you. Uh, any community things from board members? Um, I have a couple, so bear with me. This Saturday, March 3rd, Wauwatosa Avenue United Methodist Church is having um, a coffee house as a fundraiser for their mission trip for their youth, and several kids from Hale and Central both are going on that trip. Um, that's 5.30 to 7.30. It is a potluck, so bring a dish to pass. And then March 10th, Mount Hope is having a fundraiser where several of our kids also are going on that mission trip, um, and they are doing a spaghetti dinner with a silent auction from 6 to 8, I believe. And then March 14th is 7 p.m. is the candidate forum for the WAWM PTA Council. If you have questions, please submit them to council through their email. Anyone else? Seeing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda, 9.1, the approval of minutes from the February 12th regular board meeting and the February 19th uh, board workshop. 9.2, the employment summary and supplemental contracts, and 9.3, the financial summary. Does any board member need any of those separated out? Seeing none, we're okay to take those to, to approve. Thank you, second. Second. Thank you. Final discussion or questions? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. That passes, we'll move on to action items. We do have one action item on our agenda this evening. 10.1, petition to alter school district boundaries. Turn it over to you or right over to Mike? Um, we will turn it right over to Mike. Um, this is an item that uh, was previously in workshop with the board. Um, it's a result of, of a petition by um, uh, some residents that are part of the school district that live in the city of New Berlin. Uh, and I'll pass it over to you from there. Well, I'm here to answer any questions. Otherwise, um, we do have a uh, recommendation for you tonight. So, any last minute questions by board members? Did you find out how many have brought this to us in the past? Yeah, uh, it was, and of course I don't have those notes in front of me. It was in the update. Yeah, it was in the update. Yeah. It was yeah. two single family homes, I believe, in the last seven years, and one apartment complex being built. Right. I think there's been one since I've been here. Yeah. Um, did we find out then, was it on New Berlin's agenda at all? Are yeah. they voting on it also tonight? It is on New Berlin's agenda. I did receive uh, an email late today from Joe Garza, the superintendent, and they are recommending approval. Approval of what? Approval of the territory transfer. Oh. When is that vote? Tonight. Uh, this, tonight. Evening. this evening. Right, if you, it, right, if there's no motion, um, then... It dies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we're on to item number 11, board member suggestions for future uh, agenda items. And after the email, I don't know if you saw my response to Marty, I was wondering if, if it's possible to get some kind of talk, if, if we needed our, I don't know what, but before the April 16th meeting. Yeah, yeah. So, so just fill the rest of the board in. <laughs> oh, he's like, oh my, what are they talking about? Um, so, uh, a, a number of you received a um, request from a constituent about potentially moving polling places out of schools entirely, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have visited this with the city in the past um, since I've been here, and, and there was reluctance and, and, and difficulty finding enough places with good parking and that are um, ADA accessible. Um, so a little bit of resistance on the city's part, but I talked to Dan Devine about it and he said, we have a new clerk now, so maybe it's an opportunity to get fresh eyes on this and have the conversation again. Um, and so uh, Noah requested that we bring this before the board just to get a sense of direction. And so we, we're not going to do that now. We're not noticed for that, but right. just so you get a, some context here. Of like, mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll do that sooner than April 16th. If that seems the, the direction the board would like us to take, then we'll take some next steps um, with the city to see what we can potentially work out. I would like it because it um, gives us, it takes that off the radar for us and then gives us some flexibility in our calendaring um, because right now we're trying to juggle around those dates around school safety. And if we don't have to do that, it's just a little more flexibility. We could possibly see if that uh, third meeting in March or third Thursday in March, if they can bring that new clerk into our meeting. 
Uh, that's right. I'll reach out to Dan again. I asked for the April 16th one, but I'll talk to him again to see if we can have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Any other <coughs> suggestions? I actually didn't have a suggestion. I, I was trying to get the date down for the one thing I didn't be able to give my community uh, things that I attended. So would I be able to do that now? The community, the community events that I had attended in the last month? Sure. Sorry, I, I, it went by so fast. I was <laughs> apologize. So I did go to uh, uh, Wilson's uh, Wilson's um, uh, a night out with our stars, which is their talent show that they have. And uh, I tell you, there's quite a few talented elementary school kids I didn't realize that were attending my, my children's school. So it was uh, put up by the PTA. It was very well done. Um, it went pretty long, actually, <laughs> for, uh, for an elementary school event. There was uh, lots of uh, kids who wanted to sign up for it, so it was a really great event. Uh, so I wanted to give kudos to that. I also attended um, the tail end of Pershing's Math Olympics that they had last week. And uh, again, a very well attended event. I think they had said about 70 participants that were there from the school for the Math Olympics. They had lots of different stations set up. Uh, the kids had to go through and do each one. And if they got through them all, then they got a little gold medal that they got to wear in a, uh, a picture um, with a, it was a green screen, but then they had like the Olympic flag behind them so they could get. So it was really great. Uh, and then also while I was there, Pershing is one of the schools that has gotten some of the LED lights installed in them. So I was able to kind of see those LED lights in, in, in uh, action and kind of talk to some of the teachers and see what they thought. And there was a lot of positive um, discussion about the LED lights. They were a lot brighter. It was the first time they were used to such yellowed lights that they were kind of too bright to some of them. Uh, but the nice thing about these lights is they're not only motion sensor activated, but they also have uh, an optic light uh, built into them so that if it's too bright, they actually can dim those lights themselves. It shaves energy even more. And they're programmable. So if one teacher likes the room a little bit darker, a little bit brighter than another teacher, they can they can do that. So I was really impressed with the, the sorts of lights that we got. So just wanted to update everyone on that. Anyone else? OK, that ends the te televised portion of our meeting this evening. We'll take a five-minute break while Brian breaks down the cameras, and then we'll, we will reconvene for our business services workshop. We are at recess.